Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to the Wiser Center for Europe and Eurasia's lecture, Refugee Crises in Contemporary Europe, from the English Channel to the polish belarusian border. My name is Jendia Zubrzycki, I'm Professor of Sociology and Director of the Wiser Center, and we're proud to work with UMS on the occasion of its staging of Fiddler on the Roof uh, this weekend uh, by providing additional programming to UMS members or faculty and students and the great, greater Detroit area. Um, we curated an exhibit of Polish posters of Fiddler on the Roof, which is open and free to the public. So we invite you to come uh, in the gallery of the International Institute on the fifth floor of Weiser Hall. Uh, it's free and open to the public until March 18th. We also organize a roundtable on the Yiddish origins of the Broadway play and its cultural travels. Um, if you missed it on Wednesday, it was fabulous and it will soon be on our YouTube channel. Um, and today's event will address the contemporary relevance of a key theme of Fiddler uh, on the Roof, the issue of displacement, forced migration, and the plight of refugees. And before introducing our speaker, I'd like to invite Cayenne Harris, who's Vice President of Education and Community Engagement at the University Musical Society, uh, to say a few words. Cayenne? Hello, everyone, and thank you, Genevieve. Uh, on behalf of UMS, I just want to welcome everyone who's joining today. We're so excited about this production of Fiddler on the Roof uh, that has its opening Saturday at Hill Auditorium and another performance on Sunday. It is a collaboration with the School of Music, Theater and Dance and the Grand Rapids Symphony, a really exciting occasion for us. And also it has such a universal story and such relevant content uh, even today. And I think this panel, this discussion today will really exemplify that. Uh, we're so honored to partner with you, Genevieve, uh, and I'm so excited about this conversation. So thank you for every, everything you've done. And uh, to everyone out there, um, we hope to see you at one of the Fiddler on the Roof performances. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, and I'd like to mention that, uh, so we will have a conversation, John and I will have a conversation and we will leave time for uh, questions and answers at the end. But at any time during uh, the event, you can write your question using the Q&A button on the right, uh, bottom right corner of your screen. And now I would like to introduce our distinguished uh, guest, uh, John A. Young who's Senior Staff Development Officer at the UN's High Commissioner for Refugees Protection Learning Unit based in Budapest. He received a BA in Russian and East European Cities from the University of Michigan in 1986 and a JD from the UM Law School in 1990. John has devoted most of his career to refugee protection in Europe and the Middle East. He's been at the UN uh, High Commissioner for Refugees and the, the acronym is UNHCR since 1994, but he also worked at the European Commission on pre-accession projects related to law and justice, human rights, and minorities. His work uh, brought him to Russia, Switzerland, Serbia, and Slovakia, and he participated in missions to Kenya, Uganda, Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia. Throughout his career, John has been engaged in refugee status determination, resettlement, asylum by building, migration management, and the identification and response to vulnerable persons. So we're extremely pleased to have you with us, to have you back in Ann Arbor, even though it's, um, it's virtual. Uh, we're snowed in, and I think you are in Athens these days, so you're having sunshine. Thank you for taking the time to being with us and to talk to us about your work at UNHCR. John? Well, thank you very much. It, it is indeed uh, an honor and a privilege to uh, um, be back. Video? Okay, great. Okay, thanks. It's it's great to uh, to to have anything to do actually with with Ann Arbor again. It's uh, in all my travels, uh, Ann Arbor is still a place that uh, that that's very near and dear to my heart. So, uh, yes, indeed, uh, we're we're in Athens these days, um, and uh, it's it's. it's very sort of relevant to the topic we're going to discuss today, as a matter of fact. Well, actually, your job is, you know, one that, you know, you can't run out of work because there are hot spots everywhere in the world. 
Um, and there's new ones developing as we speak. So we will be talking about the situation uh, in Ukraine and on the Polish, uh, Ukrainian, Polish, Belarus uh, borders. And also of course the, the, Pol the, the, the Ukrainian Russian borders. Um, but I want to start the discussion with um, going back to Fiddler on the Roof, um, going to the last scene, and I don't think that I'm spilling the beans or really uh, telling, we know how it ends, so I hope you won't mind if you uh, allow me to quote a few verses from the last song. Um, we know that the, the Fiddler on the Roof is, is based on um, a collection of stories by Sholem Alehem, written in Yiddish. The story is, is set in the Pale of Settlement in Tsarist Russia in 1905. Uh, and the fictional shadow of Anatevka would be somewhere in today's Ukraine. Uh, Professor Misha Kutikov on Wednesday told us that it would be around uh, Kiev. Um, so the, the play's last song reads, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a pot, a pan, a broom, a hat, a bench, a tree. So what's a stove or a house? A stick of wood, a piece of cloth. What do we leave? Nothing much, only Anatevka. Underfed, overworked Anatevka. Where else could Sabbath be so sweet? Intimate, obstinate, obstinate Anatevka, where I know everyone I meet. Soon I'll be a stranger in a strange new place, searching for an old familiar face from Anatevka. I belong in Anatevka, tumble down workaday Anatevka, dear little village, little town of mine. Um, and it's a heartbreaking story of loss, of forced departure, of people forced to leave their home uh, in order to survive. And this is, as I said, it is common today. So I would like to start the conversation with um, Perhaps you could tell us a little bit about how events like the one that the play is depicting, um, and especially the Second World War and the Holocaust led to concerted efforts to help refugees and organizations like the one um, you're a part of. Yes, indeed. Uh, the, the Fiddler on the Roof is, is based on a, a factual history and a deed, and that, uh, that year that it was staged, uh, 1,500 Jews were killed in pogroms, and these pogroms continued and intensified uh, through the 20s. And as you know, eventually the number was up to 150,000 Jews who were killed uh, in the Ukraine, mostly, most of them in the Ukraine. Uh, this in itself uh, did not give rise to the League of Nations. However, the League of Nations did have a, a commissioner for refugees, and uh, this was uh, the first commissioner was uh, Nansen, and he was giving out um, uh, travel documents uh, to Russian refugees from uh, fleeing uh, the communist revolution. Uh, then they were extended to Armenians in 1924, and then to Turks, Assyrians, and uh, Kurds eventually in 1928. Um, so this, at that time, the, the there was a international recognition of the need to uh, give protection to people fleeing. But the only solutions back then were repatriation, uh, sending them back home eventually, or resettling them to another country. Uh, one of the main ways that we deal with, with refugees today is, is actually integration in countries of refuge. But that was not a feature of the pre-Second World War uh, structure. So then, of course, uh, the Second World War led to the establishment of the United Nations and immediately a, a, a regime to manage the millions uh, of refugees who were uh, generated during the Second World War. And then uh, in 1950, the UNHCR was founded and then the Refugee Convention was adopted in 1951. And these are all dates but it all had to do with the Second World War. And the, the 1951 convention, when it was, was uh, conceived, was simply meant to address only refugees from Europe coming from that conflict. That was its original um, intention. And that's what UNHCR was established to administer. Thank you for that, that, um, that background. And so, 
There are several hotspots in the world today. So we can think of Myanmar, Afghanistan, Haiti, uh, and humanitarian crises that, that force people to leave their homes. Um, and these crises in different hotspots are felt elsewhere. So they're felt on the US-Mexican border, the Canada-US border too. Um, in Europe, also with a recent crisis at the Polish-Belarusian border, or in the English Channel where refugees and migrants were trying to, to, to leave France to reach uh, the UK. Um, so can you play, please explain you know, what's going on in, in Poland and how, uh, in Poland, excuse me, in Europe and, and how UNHCR is responding and even preemptively preparing for, for example, what's going on in Ukraine now with the, the crisis with Russia. Right, I mean, UNHCR has been in Europe essentially since 1951. So uh, over the last 20 to 30 years, it has been trying to basically enhance the capacity of the new EU member states to manage uh, refugee flows and migration flows and, and to build, let's say, an, an asylum space, uh, an alternative to the typical or the, the traditional asylum countries, which, which we can name as Germany, Sweden, the UK, France, Belgium, Netherlands, uh, uh, as the main historical asylum countries. So we have had a presence uh, in various and almost all of the European capitals uh, for decades. That, that's uh, true. And we, we, of course, in the wake of previous uh, um, IDP, uh, internally displaced person uh, situation in the Ukraine, we have a fairly robust uh, office structure. I can just put it on the screen so you get a sense. Uh, here is our Ukraine operation. We have about 114 staff in the Ukraine. And we have, we, of course, Kiev is the main office, but we have sub offices all along these, uh, these uh, disputed territories and the Russian and Ukrainian border right here. So uh, to talk about the Ukraine for the moment, um, because of the previous uh, displacements, uh, which were mainly uh, internal to the Ukraine, we do have a fairly robust field presence. Uh, it must be said, however, that uh, should uh, a war-like situation develop, um, we would need to, to certainly reinforce our presence, as would uh, the neighboring countries, uh, you know, especially Poland. It would be one of the first countries uh, of uh, where you would start to see people who are seeking safety in the event uh, of, of a conflict. So we do have a presence in Poland. It's not as nearly as scaled up as the Ukraine. We have uh, 15 staff and all of them are in Warsaw. And we have been engaged in the case uh, in Poland and in, in this recent uh, situation on the Belarusian border. Uh, we uh, engaged in a lot of quiet diplomacy, which uh, is how we sort of urge the authorities to, uh, first of all, allow a humanitarian response. And in the case of Poland, they have the capacity, so they don't need the international community to provide that. They have their own uh, resources and their own NGOs, but we certainly uh, try to leverage our relationship to enable access by NGOs uh, to, to make sure that people crossing the border are, are, are taken care of. This is especially this winter, uh, people were freezing to death and this is something that um, we tend to do, uh, as, as I say, behind the scenes, but we're there. Um, and at the same time, we've been in Poland um, and again, for 30 years, uh, we've been working with the government, we've been working with the border guards, we've been working with the judiciary, uh, we've been working with fantastic NGOs. Po uh, the Polish Helsinki Committee is the, one of the, the, the leading NGOs in Central Europe. And um, so we are there and we, are, we, we have, a, I would say, a quiet presence. But we, it, it is not uh, the same sort of uh, 
setup that you would get in some of the larger uh, migration flows uh, that you would see uh, in response to Syria in Iraq or in Turkey, because uh, we, we, as of yet, haven't, A, haven't seen such numbers, and B, uh, EU member states have, a, have their own uh, asylum and refugee uh, framework. Um, and it, it's, it's uh, in, in some ways even, I would say, superior or exceeding the Geneva Convention standards. So we have also a presence in Belarus, uh, also all in Minsk. Uh, we had been on the way towards phase, fading out uh, of Minsk because the, let's say, the demand for our uh, advice probably wasn't uh, what, what we'd like it to be. Uh, and as well, the numbers just weren't there as well uh, until uh, the fall of last year. So, so again, in, in all of these countries, uh, we have been there again for decades and working with the judiciary and the, and the border guards. And so we do have, we do have uh, an influence on, on the way things unfold, on the responses that are taken by the government. But of course, the big show in town is the European Commission and the European Union and the Frontex and the European Asylum a service and and, uh, and and what have you. But so, yeah, please. Well, I wanted to, to ask you because that's, you know, when we're reading news here in, in North America, we read about the, the, the refugee, the refugees at, at borders. And then we often read like pushback, well, these are not refugees, they're migrants. And, you know, is that a political distinction? Is that, uh, a political distinction that might still have an impact on how uh, these populations are treated or can be helped, or can, can you unpack that distinction for us? That would be very and helpful, I think. That that's key, and this is this uh, it, this is really the launching point for understanding what's happening is to understand the essential difference between a refugee, and that's a person who's who's fleeing persecution in their own country based on their religion, or membership in a social group or ethnicity or race. Uh, and they can't go home because they would be persecuted. That's a refugee. Now, a migrant may leave a home for, for reasons that we might consider to be uh, worthy. Uh, they may not be able to, to, to sustain their families or, or or they, they may be simply looking for a better life. The thing is, once they leave, they can go back. They won't be persecuted uh, in their country of origin. Um, there won't be any sort of trigger of the 1951 Geneva Convention, which is, as I say, the essential point of that convention is to protect people from their own governments. Uh, when when their, their government is, is persecuting them or and this is important, is unwilling to protect them when they're getting uh, persecuted by other elements of society. And so in either of those uh, circumstances, people have the right to security and protection in a, a neighboring or a country further along. And this is what we, this is UNHCR's primary mission. Hand in hand with that, is that once uh, somebody crosses a border, whether they have all their documents or they have nothing, if they're intending to seek asylum and they're looking for protection, it doesn't matter if, if uh, the way they get into the country may not be considered legal. That is not, that is not the point because um, as, 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 as you know, you sometimes have to leave overnight to have time to collect your documents. So the, the other side of our work is to encourage countries not to push people back into situations where they may end up once again in those countries where they're being persecuted. And this right there, uh, this term pushback uh, is something that has dramatically uh, increased uh, all across Europe, especially the external borders. And so it means that people who are trying to seek protection or safety are simply being pushed back at EU borders. And they're not allowed to make their, uh, 
their case for asylum. We have to find out, are they refugees or not? Well, that's a process. And it, it's, it's a difficult one. It's one of the most difficult things actually in law is, is to determine whether the credibility of someone who is giving you a claim based on persecution. How do you know and how do you find out if somebody is really fleeing in fear for their lives? And, and uh, this, takes, this takes a legal procedure. And this is what, uh, what we try to, uh, and try to guarantee. So how do you do that determination? I mean, how do you establish that? Because I'm, I'm thinking again of the recent cases at the, the Polish border, because this is the edge of the EU actually, and where people were even flown in uh, by the Belarusian government and being weaponized. Uh, they are victims, they are dying in the forest. Uh, are they refugees or are they, they migrants. Well, okay. Uh, the, our our approach is to take every case individually. However, we do recognize, and this would be the case of Poland, uh, after having, let's say, uh, a, a smaller number of asylum seekers relative to Germany or France, and then suddenly there's an influx, a burst uh, uh, through the border. Uh, and how, how does a country deal with that? Now we can help enhance the, the capacity uh, to, to make these determinations, but it takes a process. It takes uh, an interview. It takes um, also the, the authorities need to know what the situation is like in the country in question. Now, in this case, uh, it's interesting because we talked about this before. Uh, a lot of these uh, people who were coming to the Polish border were from the northern part of Iraq, Kurdistan. Now, there was, of course, a time when just uh, being a Kurd from Iraq should mean automatic uh, protection and asylum. But those days uh, are, are actually already a couple of decades ago. And having worked in Kurdistan uh, for a while, I, you, know, you, you can see that the, the situation may not be the best economically, but it's a more difficult uh, case to make that they're being persecuted. Now, then I hasten to add that depends on the ethnicity because it's not only Kurds in Kurdistan. You have Yazidis and they may still have a compelling claim. But all of this needs to be sussed out and all of this needs to be uh, put into the hands of, the, of an expert who can determine where the family's from, the sort of, or the, the applicant is from and sort of determine the, the, the personal circumstances because the asylum claim needs to be based on a personal situation not sort of a general claim i'm just because i'm in this case kurdish means i'm persecuted oh no the person has to show that they are persecuted and this is a this is a challenge for both sides to make the the, the case and also to examine the case so so it's really quite a quite a i would say sophisticated procedure uh what we there are there are several alternatives to um, to uh, going through that full procedure, but the one that's not uh, acceptable is 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 simply pushing people back into a situation where they are helpless and not protected, and and their claims are not evaluated, which is that case in, in Belarus. So, what do you think right now? I mean, what uh, there are several hot spots in Europe. Um, Right, so France, the UK, Eastern Europe, uh, you're in Athens, you said that the situation is difficult stance there as well. Can you tell us a bit about, um, and, and I should say that your organization is based in Budapest, you are physically most of the time in Serbia, you travel a lot, so you know basically the situation in, in several countries of Europe and you deal with the EU and with, um, also the nation, the governments of, of specific nations. So could you tell us a little bit about what you see is, is the key issues in 2022? Well, it turns out uh, somehow coincidentally that I, several years ago I was in Iraq and then I was in Turkey or vice versa, and then uh, Serbia and then Hungary. And so I've managed to sort of be along 
it's what's called the, the Balkan route. And I've sort of seen the, what, what is creating the move in the first place and then the, the, the different approaches that are taken. And let's look at the Syrian uh, situation for the moment. Uh, it's also similar to the Afghan movement. They all sort of eventually get to and pass through Turkey. And so right there you have a, 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 let's say a very important agreement between the European Union and Turkey. The European Union is paying billions of euros to Turkey to um, somehow uh, stem the flow of people, migrants, refugees, asylum seekers, what have you, so they don't leave Turkey and so they, they don't get into the now, of course, uh, this has been uh, successful to a large extent, but um, significant numbers still make their way into Greece. They try to get to Greece, and they do this by very dangerous ways. Um, refugees, migrants, they're all dependent upon smugglers, more or less, to get into the EU. And that is a very dangerous situation to be in, because the smugglers... They'll, they'll make their money just by moving the person from A to B that, without regard to how it's done or, or, or to the safety. So they could be stuffed in trucks and, and, uh, and freezing trucks, and they might you know, uh, endure some real hardships crossing the Turkish-Greek border or the Turkish-Bulgarian border, or dinghies. Now, we, we've all seen the pictures of what's happened to, to people who uh, have drowned trying to make th this journey from Turkey to Greece. Now, the numbers of, <laughs> and this is, this is where uh, looking around Athens today, you can really still see that there's a lot of people not from Athens or Greece that are here and around and, and sort of waiting. They're in a bit of limbo. Maybe they've, they've applied for asylum, they're waiting for the interview or uh, they're, they maybe even have gotten refugee status, but they don't have any, any way to move on. But what is unfortunately happening, let's say in a less public way, is that the, again, the border forces are pushing people back. And this is a very dangerous game, uh, especially when you're talking about movements at sea. Uh, when you're trying to push dinghies back into Turkish waters, uh, you're trying to keep them off the, the islands, which have mainly been depopulated from, uh, from, from the migrants and the refugee situation. They're trying to keep it that way and they're putting people in, in, in danger to do it. And this happens all along the boat. Now. If they do manage to get to Greece, they don't want to stay because the job opportunities aren't here. They want to go to the tradi traditional asylum countries. And I started off saying, EU and UNHCR has been trying to build capacity in Poland, in Slovakia, Hungary, etc. If you look at the numbers, people are still going to the same places. They don't want to learn Hungarian. Mm -hmm. They don't want to learn even Croatian, which is a lovely country uh, for, for many of us. They want to get to Germany where their family is, or Sweden where their family is, or the UK, or France. But, um, and this is sort of another unfortunate element that we're no strangers to in the States either is the populist approach is keep the, keep the foreigners out. And this has been uh, used and abused to, to a great extent in uh, several of the, particularly the central European countries. And, uh, you know, I mentioned, uh, I mentioned Hungary, that's where I'm working uh, these days and I've been able to see things for myself. There simply aren't any migrants in Hungary, they, they can't get in. Uh, and if they do, they don't stay long because they have no intention of settling in a place such as, again, Hungary or Croatia or Slovakia, where Slovaks, Croats and, and Hungarians are leaving to find work in, in Germany. So this whole populist uh, abuse of, of the, the migration uh, situation is being, it's being obviously used for political purposes. Uh, it has almost no basis in fact. People may be passing through, but they have no intention of staying and, and depriving and, and, and feeding off the, 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 the local welfare systems. This, isn't, this just isn't happening. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, 
the the sort of uh, vitriolic uh, you know, rhetoric regarding migrants uh, in, in uh, also North America, but in Europe, is leading to a case a uh, situation where border guards are are literally beating the daylights out of people who are trying to pass through. And this is something that, that uh, we also, the UNHCR is also uh, working with local NGOs to document. And this- uh, and the, violence also, against, the violence against refugees and or migrants. It's, it's, it's astounding. Uh, we, we had a talk uh, several weeks ago about the Balkan route and we saw you know, how they would get from Turkey to Greece and into Serbia where they were, frankly, treated quite well. Uh, they, they get shelter, they get food, they get medical services. And they need medical services, not from where they've come from, but for what happens to them when they try to get into Hungary or Croatia or uh, Romania. They're, the border guards are beating the living daylights out of them. And they come back to Serbia. We make sure that they get medical attention and the Serbian government makes sure they get medical attention. I have to say, uh, only for them to sort of recuperate and then try again. And we talked to people who went through this 20, 30, 40 times, but they eventually go through. So all of the human rights abuses that are taking places at the borders, they don't have not that it would be justified, but they don't even have the effect of, of, of stopping the migration. It, it just simply, uh, it, it, it results in, in casualties, but people just, uh, they make their way they, and they, they end up making their claims in Germany, Sweden, et cetera. So for the moment, most of, of, of the, the refugees and migrants you see are coming from the Middle East, still from the Syrian conflict? Good numbers. And, and actually, of course, as you would expect, the numbers coming from Afghanistan are increasing, right. but they've always been pretty high. This, this, you know, Afghanistan's been at war for most of our lives, uh, if, we, if, we, if we really want to put it that way. Um, and so, of course, the numbers are starting to increase, but they're having troubles as well. They're having troubles um, getting, getting into and through Iran and then getting into and through Turkey, and uh, they're also uh, this, the the difficulty and the, and, the, and the hardship that they're that they're they're facing, trying to get out of a war torn country and get out of the fighting, is unimaginable. Uh, unless you've you know really had a chance to work with them and talk to them a little bit, you know. Um, and then on the other side, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very complex issue uh, because as well, some, many of them are also being, let's say, sent by their families mm -hmm. and their families will pay the smugglers a certain amount of money to get them into Germany. And then uh, basically the, the children and often they're, they're underage are just at the mercy of these so-called uncle, uncles, these, these smugglers. And it's turned into, for those who start to run out of money, uh, it gets really, really ugly. It gets, uh, you get uh, the smugglers who are sending threats to the families back home, coer coercing them to send more money or else they'll, se they'll, they'll send the ear back home. Or another thing that's happening with these children is that uh, they're being used to smuggle drugs uh, to pay the rest of their the rest of their journey. Or human so trafficking. Get, what about you know, sex workers? They're sex. I mean, they're not sex workers. They're sex slaves, actually, yes. or or other forms of of slavery. Uh, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. And this is this is exactly what what happens. It starts off uh, as a you know seeking some kind of safety, then they inevitably fall into the hands of smugglers and then it can turn into even trafficking, depending on, on the, whether the, the, the family back home can keep, keep up the payments. They will exploit these children, not only children, youths, young, young people, young adults as well, uh, to, to whatever extent they can to make sure that they get the money. 
So um, one might even posit that, th that they're facing graver hardships after they leave the country. Right. Uh, but certainly it, they're, they're, in, they're in a horrible situation. Staying in Afghanistan, uh, it, it, if, if you're regarded as an enemy to the, to the Taliban, well, your, your chances are pretty slim. But then uh, as an Afghan trying to move into Europe, also your chances are, are, are pretty slim. Well, that shows the desperation of the situation they're in. Um, I, we have a couple of questions. I don't know if there was um, other things. I know that you had slides also to show, but perhaps that will go, you might use them to answer, answer some questions. questions. Yeah. Okay, so let's do that. Um, so we have a question by Ardun Arwin. Uh, thank you very much. The representation of refugees and migrants in the press in Britain, for example, is largely negative, and there's a perception for migration as a threat. I was wondering if you have any thoughts on what can be done in host countries to overturn such views and help educate everyday citizens about our responsibilities as global citizens to accept and welcome migrants. Are there ways of overcoming the political instrumentalization of migration by various actors in recent years? Well, that's really a million dollar question. And, um, you know, this is something that UNHCR dedicates uh, um, many of its staff and, and budget to is, is trying to um, try to counter, again, this populist press, which uh, you, you're mentioning in, in the UK, but of course, back home, uh, you know, we, 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 it's hard to get away from. And it, it, it's, it's, uh, it, there is no easy answer to that. Back uh, home, you mean, you mean here in the US? Ann Arbor. <laughs> Ann Arbor is not such a problem. But uh, where I'm actually, yeah. no, I mean, uh, back home in the US generally, okay. I mean, it, you, because people uh, are getting their information from certain, uh, you know, let's say sources, and it's and, and, and it's difficult to to sort of penetrate the, these um, these funnels, uh, and and I, I think that this is uh, this is a question to which we don't have a satisfactory answer yet. I mean, you can see that the um, especially in the countries with the free press, like the UK, you know, in North American uh, countries, you you really have very little opportunity to to sort of penetrate certain uh, information flows i've seen however in the less democratic countries where you you have a government that that makes sure that the press isn't um, making noise about the migrants mm -hmm. and in fact that uh, does sort of reduce the uh, reduce the the, 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 the the let's say the negative impact on them of course that's that's not the way we want to go either so I don't know. I mean, how do we, how do we um, persuade a populace to uh, consume uh, news rather than editorial uh, is probably the more basic well, question. I remember during the Syrian crisis, the photograph of that small boy yes, you know, on a beach. So you, there are moments like this, actually photographs, images that capture really the the situation, the gravity of the situation, and that mobilize people to that could shift actually pu public opinion because it's 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 so horrible. But it is, I mean, it is a. I mean, but you know, questions. yes, th th this is exactly my point. Really, is that this was a, a I believe, a Syrian lad um, on a Turkish beach. Uh, you know, the, the picture was uh, later taken of the, the Turkish policeman, you know, trying to, you know, I don't know, at least carrying the boy, it looked like he was sleeping, you know, but how did the boy get there? The boy was pushed back. And that was several years ago, and it's gotten a lot worse. Mm -hmm. So yeah. indeed, that triggered a reaction. But then again, we got back to uh, this, this, uh, this dynamic. Hmm. Well, I mean, it means that basically this, the, 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 the reactions of populations and their governments is related to what they know about the situation. And um, with conflicts being long lasting like they have been in certain regions of the world, 
uh, people are also get tired of those situations and get less sympathetic uh, to them. So that must make your work very difficult also, kind of continue and feeling like it's, there's a constant un influx of refugees, but fatigues on the part of the governments and of the populations that elect those, those people. Again, being in Athens, thinking of the myth of Sisyphus, I mean, it, 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 that is uh, very much our job. Um, you know, make a little progress and have it roll back. Uh, and, uh, and they have a vicious circle with populism and the governments and the people who, who choose populist governments. And this, and this all sort of this anti-refugee, anti-migrant ignorance really just, just feeds onto itself. And, and the only way to break the cycle is to, to somehow win an election. I guess. Yes. Um, okay, so we have several more questions. Uh, let's go by twos, perhaps, so that you have time to respond. So one is by James Wells. The smuggler question is heartbreaking. Are there good estimates for how the migrant flow into the EU would change if, quote unquote, all barriers were eliminated to come and make their case for refugee status and smugglers would have less power? So yeah. uh, question, um, yeah. and another question that uh, related to also smugglers by Nikki Rod, are there mm -hmm. efforts by the UN and or local authorities to cracking down on migrant smugglers and how? And here uh, we're using a, migrants again, it might be refugees as well, so. Yeah, yeah, no, this is another uh, double-sided coin because the so-called fight against smugglers is actually a noble way of, of uh, sort of camouflaging the fight against migrants, honestly. So um, if in, in, in the event that, um, in the event that, uh, you know, somebody, <laughs> somebody manages to, uh, to well, stop smuggling, it, it, I, I don't. Uh, I don't see that happening, and I don't see the EU countries or any countries uh, uh, sort of lowering their bo their borders or boundaries to allow people in. I, I, you know, you you had it for a while in Germany, and it, this the, this must be uh, underlined and and, and, and italicized and, and written in bold that Germany took in uh, in a very short period of time more than a million asylum seekers. And they put them through the asylum process. They didn't give them blanket uh, citizenship or anything like that. They had to demonstrate their point. Of course, many were from Syria and that's an easy case to make. But then it stopped because then there was a popular backlash and then it became political. So you, you have these sort of moments where, um, you know, you, you, the barriers are, are, are lowered, if you will. But uh, to, to, to imagine a permanent state, I guess, you, you know, I, I don't know if it's ever existed, that would take away the power of the smuggler, but then it might also feed into this, again, this vicious circle of, of populism and, 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 and the, po the politicians you get from it. So I don't know. I, I, uh, I would like to see everybody get a fair shot. And that's what UNHCR uh, advocates for, certainly. Um, yeah. A question uh, by Niki Rad, again, a follow up, but, but that falls into another one of mine. I mean, you just mentioned mm -hmm. that, that Germany took a lot of, of Syrian refugees and, and asylum seekers, but there was also the fear that uh, some of the bad people would also get in, right? So that uh, how do you make that determination? And we know like Germany had that experience too of, you know, lots of Nazis yeah. who found refuge in South America. Um, so uh, the question here about the case by case evaluation of refugees uh, is a very important one in order to determine um, the legitimacy of the claim. Um, and so that's one question. And then Niki Rod's question is about the backlog that this process, which is a serious investigation, creates. And uh, what kind of time frames uh, are we talking about? What kind of status and accommodations do the refugee applicants uh, live mm. once, they're, once they're in waiting period? Well, I, I, uh, this is uh, an excellent question and it, and it very much depends on the country in question. 
uh, certain countries, uh, again, Germany, Sweden, uh, France, the UK, they have a fairly good capacity to, uh, if you will, process claims in order to consider the merits of claim and, and do the proper and have the right to appeal. There are other countries which don't really make tremendous effort. And again, if we're talking about the EU countries, then we're talking about the newer, uh, the newer members who, for one reason or another, despite um, significant help from, from UNHCR, but more so from the EU, they just don't have the capacity and they frankly don't want it. And maybe the devil might argue they don't need it because, as I was saying earlier, they don't want to learn the languages. They don't want to try to integrate. They don't want to learn Romanian and try to get a job in Romania when Romanians are, are leaving to work in, 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 in Germany. See. So uh, the interesting thing is, is that in Romania, they have a very good asylum system and they have all the checks and balances. And it's actually one of the model asylum systems. Uh, and people get recognized who should be recognized. But then once they're recognized, boff, they're off. They go mm -hmm. on to, uh, they go on to uh, Germany again uh, or, or else, elsewhere. So... Uh, the a proper process takes a while and it also needs good lawyers. It also needs uh, the right to appeal. It needs the judiciary to, to have, you know, asylum law is very particular. You can't just pick it up in a day. It takes months, if not years. So, you know, you need a lot of uh, uh, properly moving parts. And, and refugees or claimants are housed during that time? Sometimes, and yes. Sometimes, no. Uh, some countries insist on it, others don't. Um, some t in, in some countries, they'll get a stipend. In other countries, they're on their own, even in the EU. Um, and, and you're seeing, again, the numbers are declining in terms of um, uh, uh, applications as well as uh, recognitions of refugee status since, um, since uh, 2010. Uh, there was the spike, of course, in 2015, 16, and 17, but now it's even lower than it was before 2010. Uh, and one has to wonder, what is causing that? Is it because people aren't interested in coming? Absolutely not. That is not the case. They're coming in the same numbers as ever. Because you can tell in a country, a transit country like Serbia or Bosnia, the numbers are higher than ever. And then uh, when I do the, the research on the, on the statistics in the EU member states and the numbers are dropping, then something, something, mm -hmm. something isn't functioning the way it should. And that means that people aren't getting into the systems and they're not get, getting the opportunity to apply for asylum. Well, could it I be mean, that general. they're trying to go through, you know, under the radar? And it's absolutely. And they don't even want to apply in the, in the first EU countries. And this is, this is, and, and this is, being in Greece uh, really reminds me of one of the, the main problems uh, that the, the EU faces. And I worked for the EU for a while and I very, very much believed in uh, and believe in, in, in what it stands for. And, and uh, the rule of law is, is I think, the, the way you, you could describe it. But it's like a ship that was built for fair weather. Uh, and it worked perfectly in fair weather. I, I think that you, you can't find another human endeavor in history uh, as, as impressive as the European Union, I would dare say. But then when the weather is choppy uh, or unfavorable, when you have a migration crisis, as it's often called, then the bits and pieces of the EU start to, to fly off. And this is where you get a country uh, which, is, which isn't as endowed with... with um, resources, at least financial resources, is Germany, Greece is taking the burden of, of the entire, almost the entire influx from, from, um, from the east and the south. And is that fair? And I think the Greeks would say it is. But again, you, the, the idea of burden sharing is, I think, is essential and critical aspect of, of EU membership. And this is exactly where the wheel stop started to fall off the wagon because Italy and Greece were asking for help from other EU member states. Can you please at least house them until a, you know, a decision can be made on their case? And it, it was a categorical no from, again, the new EU member 
states, mm-hmm. even though they had the, 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 the capacity and, 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 and the places to put them, they didn't. And so this, uh, this tension, and this pressure built up and built up and built up on Greece and on Italy in particular, because of, uh, you, you see this, this idea of, of uh, burden sharing actually started to fall apart when the, when the, when the water started to get choppy. Um, we have time for maybe two more questions. Um, so one is by Karen Gertz. Uh, does being granted asylum in one country, say Romania, then hold for all other countries in the EU and elsewhere? So that's a factual question. Um, but there's another one uh, by uh, Liliana Baiger. Um, I apologize if I mispronounce your last name. Um, She's asking, uh, how does the Polish government benefit from keeping guards on the Polish-Belarus border if the society seems to be empathetic uh, towards the lot of the refugees migrants? Is there any legal way to enable Polish society to help those people in the forest? Um, that, <laughs> I think that um, the Polish society is blessed again with some very strong NGOs. And I think that uh, access to those areas, however, has been difficult to obtain for, for those NGOs. Um, you have local residents who have take, uh, taken initiatives to, to help those that they've, that, that they've run across. But I think that um, that is a, a challenge that hasn't, let's say, completely been addressed. Um, is getting full access. Border areas are usually uh, sensitive areas to begin with. Now, when you, you know, on top of it, you have a have a refugee or a migrant or whatever combined situation like this, then the authorities are particularly, uh, let's say, to be generous, sensitive about it, and uh, probably not allowing the same sort of access that you'd like to see. Uh, on our side, we are advocating uh, night and day for NGOs to have that access. And the question about uh, your point of entry, let's say you or let's say you obtain asylum status in Romania, can you then can refugees then move to other uh, countries of the EU? Well, that often happens, and that that's exactly um, that's exactly what happens uh, when. They'll enter Bulgaria, for example. They may even may even get refugee status in Bulgaria, but that's they quickly see that they're not going to be able to to feed themselves or their families or or really sort of make themselves a future. And so, yeah, they 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 move on. They often pass through non-EU member states, like again Serbia or Bosnia, and then enter again into uh, uh, into uh, EU member states. Uh, that's also because Romania and Bulgaria aren't part of the Schengen zone, so it's not it's that easy for them to move uh, uh, legitimately into e- into the uh, Western EU member states. So, uh, yeah, they move on. There's not a lot of recognized refugees uh, who decide to stay in those countries. But do they, their, their paperwork is not valid in other EU countries? Uh, they are recognized as uh, they uh, as, as having refugee status in Romania, and therefore, if they haven't in the meantime acquired some kind of permanent residence or certainly citizenship, only when they have citizenship do they really have the full rights to, to circulate within the EU. Uh, they may have uh, they may have obtain some sort of permanent residence or long-term residence, which could also be used, but not, not, that takes a while. It takes years to even get, uh, you have to have five years of short-term residence to get a long-term residence, for example. So, I mean, that's really the reason also why people do not even try to receive asylum status in Romania, because if their final destination is to reunite with family in Germany or the UK, uh, exactly. Finding your way. Uh, and they don't want to get stuck. Right, exactly. They don't want to get stuck because then what will happen if, you know, they're caught on the street in, in, in I don't know, France or Germany and they don't have a, a 
acceptable reason. They, they can be sent back. I mean, they, they, that's the well, way the system is set up. France is having its presidential election in a couple of months, and I've been following the, the, the candidacies of, of, of several candidates and the speeches, and uh, the right is really insisting on building borders, stranding the EU borders, but also reincorporating borders internally to the EU. Um, and people respond to that. So even countries where, you know, countries that have been more generous than others in accepting refugees and migrants now are, are politicizing the issue in ways that are very uh, problematic and potentially detrimental for, for asylum seekers. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah, it, it's it, it's a real it's a hot potato in any in any country. I mean, um, even in those countries that aren't accepting anybody, and I, that's the one where I usually work. Uh, it still somehow is a, a source of uh, I don't know grist for the political mill, and uh, they they also have their elections coming up as well, and and this is the this is the topic that just is uh, the go to for I, I I think you probably observed that yourself uh, mm -hmm. in, in, in most European countries when it when it comes election time, you right. know, they start talking about uh, the migrants. Well, John, I'm very grateful for your taking the time to talk to us. Um, and thank you for your work on behalf of refugees. We, I mean, this is very important work and uh, thank you for sharing your expertise and your experiences with us. And I invite everyone tomorrow and Sunday to come uh, see the production of Fiddling the Roof at UMS at Hill Editorium, and also to visit um, the, the exhibition of Polish posters of the Broadway play. Um, and if you love today's event and you want to recommend it to your friends and family, you can do so by uh, going in a few days to our YouTube channel. The talk will be posted and then you can give them the link, share the link. So thank you everyone for being here. Thank you, Cayenne Harris, for inviting us to organize this event. And of course, mostly to John Young. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. Have a thank nice you. Bye-bye.